Hello, this is an Academy session. Um, it's quite a sombre session, but we are a bunch of autistic people who would like to respond to media reportings of violence and victimisation by neurodivergent people. Um, and by that, what we mean is the, the, the use in the media of scapegoating violent crime, for instance, by stating that the person was autistic or had a mental health issue or something like that. And we're kind of frustrated by that um, and we want to discuss the issues with it. Um, so I am Dr. Chloe Farahar and I am a white woman with a shaved head, large glasses in kind of like a rose colored dress sitting in my office um, and are joined today by some fantastic people um, to have this discussion. Uh, Tigger, would you mind describing yourself? Hi, my name's Tigger. I am a mid fifties white male with um, bald head, wearing a, a green sweat top today, and um, quite passionately an autistic advocate. Thank you, David. My name is David Gray Hammond. I am a early thirties white male uh, with glasses, shaved head, and a beard, and I'm wearing a blue t-shirt. Thank you, and Monique. Wonderful. I am Dr. Monique Botha and I do, I'm an autistic autism researcher and I focus on things like minority stress, mental health and victimization. Um, and I am white, um, wearing big black glasses, a really funky looking shirt that is blue in pattern um, and sitting in a currently half empty office at home. Thank you. And Kieran? Hi, I'm Kieran Rose. Um, I'm an autistic consultant and I am a white male with black glasses, balding gray hair and slightly overweight. And um, I'm wearing a check t-shirt. It's making my eyes go funny, actually, the check t-shirt. <laughs> go and change it if it's horrible. No, no, it's fine, it's fine. Um, and Amy? Hi, I am Dr. Amy Pearson. I am an autistic psychologist. I'm mostly focused on masking and victimization in my research. And I am an early 30s, early-ish white woman with two-tone blonde-ish hair. And I'm wearing a gray vest that looks a little bit like TV static. I know I've got both Kieran and you next to each other. It's good because you're only small, so that's, that's not a problem. Um, so obviously, um, for anybody watching, trigger warnings that we are discussing quite a sensitive topic. Um, and I think to start off with, it would be good to just have a brief conversation about why are we having this discussion? So what are we fed up with? What are we frustrated by? Um, I don't know if um, Tigger and David, if you'd like to jump in about why are we having this discussion what's frustrating us well I know for me personally um my entire advocacy career actually started because of a mass shooting uh in America and uh they they blamed um they, they blamed uh mental health and autism for the mass shooters um actions and uh i i kind of i got very angry i i i wrote an article it is somehow my most viewed article to date um and uh yeah that i guess that's why i'm here cuz i'm an autistic mental health and addiction advocate and i see mental health and or you know and and being autistic and just being neurodivergent in general it, it's always bought out whenever particularly when uh, a white person uh commits an act of terror or mass violence and tigger any further thoughts and on echoing, why? echoing david's as well it's every time um the media jumps upon labels signposts points the arrow and it's 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 you know you, you open Facebook you open um, news apps you open the newspaper you look on television and more and more and more um, the word is there blaming aspects of society pointing the finger towards you know awesome autistic individuals 
um, mental health issues and so on. And it just seems to be something that it almost feels like it's gaining momentum. If I can say that, repulsively so, it almost feels like it's like, yeah, let's put this on the page. Let's put this up there. And that I am, you know, totally, totally, totally against and fed up of. And I'm going to come to um, Monique, Kieran and Amy in a second as well, because we kind of had a, a brief um, discussion about what we were going to talk about, um, which Kieran said some um, important and interesting things too. Um, and the comment that I made was, given my background, which is mental health stigma reduction, um, it does feel like a more recent thing to jump on neurodevelopmental differences as reporting in the media that this is the reason that person committed uh, a violent act, for instance. Whereas I'm used to, from when I started getting into mental health stigma reduction, it largely being down to reporting that the person had a mental health issue. So I would bring out, you know, um, uh, newspaper clippings, because they used to be newspapers, newspaper clippings, which would say, you know, um, you had that, uh, a man who crashed a plane with a lot of people on board and killed everybody. And he was, it had been experiencing extreme depression and the media jumped on that. Well, it must have been the depression, completely ignoring that the majority of people with mental health issues are really not likely to perpetrate any violence. They're more likely to be victims. So, Kieran, you said something interesting. So why do you feel that we're starting to see this shift from specifically mental health being blamed to maybe neurodevelopmental differences being blamed? I think it's um, <clears throat> stigma that's being generated as the neurodiversity paradigm becomes more popularised. Um, I think there's more attention on... We, we're all struggling. We, we're all struggling to advocate the fact that, you know, autistic people and the wider neurodivergent community that we don't behave in any ways that are problematic that you know a lot of it is pressure from the outside that causes us to react and and those kind of things but there's also as this paradigm has become more popularized it's been taken hold by certain groups individuals the press and um, even aspects of academia where neurodiversity has become an othering thing itself it's them over there and they act in certain ways so the paradigm hasn't shifted for them it's just become a rebranding and i think as that's become more culturally recognized it's become easier to point the finger at certain groups so someone for instance might have committed some kind of atrocity a shooting or whatever and they will be described as isolated well who are isolated autistic people are isolated therefore he's autistic or you know so that narrative just kind of winds on from there and you can see the the domino effect of how it's kind of happened but it doesn't make it right and it doesn't mean that it isn't stigmatizing even if it is it does have elements of truth to it doesn't mean that the way it's being reported isn't massively stigmatizing to a whole group of people who don't commit those kind of acts and particularly, like you say, jumping on that thing, who's isolated, autistic people um, and things like that. Um, and we're always trying to explain just because we aren't necessarily around lots of people doesn't mean necessarily we're unhappy. Um, but th that's a different discussion as well. Um, I don't know. So Monique and, and Amy, if you are willing to discuss maybe some of the literature or just things that you're aware of in terms of what is the likelihood that violent crime would be committed or perpetrated by neurodivergent people, i.e. an autistic person. So what's, what is the literature actually saying about these things? Monique or Amy, I don't. I don't mind um, speaking about this one. So at the, it's very, very hard to estimate prevalence because the numbers we have only take into account people who are knowingly diagnosed. Um, there's a suggestion that autistic people are not more likely to commit crime, but they might be more likely to be represented within certain categories of crime. At least that's what certain academics are suggesting um, based on kind of very low numbers and individual case studies. So it's really hard to make any kind of sweeping generalization about that. And I think what both myself and Monique have found is that Autistic people are much more likely to experience violence and victimization um, compared to people within the general population, which given kind of the, the statistical prevalence of neurodiversity in general is really bleak to consider when you've got 
actually autistic and other neurodivergent people much more likely to be represented within those categories, really overrepresented compared to non-autistic and, and otherwise neurotypical people in general. And Monique, you said something really important that a lot of us are aware of, but the media is still problematically reporting, which is uh, the difference between media reporting when somebody is neurodivergent and happens to be white. Would you mind commenting on that? Yeah, so I think that there's a couple of things and autism is tied to whiteness in that, for example, you're less likely to get a diagnosis if you are not white. Um, we have this stereotyped image of autistic people as being um, little white boys, usually. Um, so there are a lot of stereotypes there anyway. But whenever someone commits an atrocity, the, the terms that we roll out in the media depends largely on race, in that people of color, when they commit atrocities, are termed terrorists and then with white people we we are so slow to use the label terror even when the whole aim of the incident was to make people feel terrorized um instead we roll out things around mental health or um increasingly we hear the term asperger syndrome which as a diagnosis doesn't even exist anymore it's it's just autism um but then people roll out that label and part of it is they want to i think explain why this person is nothing like them or no nothing like the people around them they they as we talked about a bit earlier they're looking for a reason for this person to be other that can explain it but the problem is they're looking in the wrong place because being autistic isn't why someone then goes and commits an atrocity. Um, there are other things like violent ideology um, that autistic and non-autistic people are susceptible to that is much better at it explaining this. Um, but I definitely think that there's a racial element to it um, in that we we can't con ah slightly losing Monique white people Monique your internet's a little bit patchy um but yes thank you um I only lost you at the end so I've got the, the really important parts of that um comment thank you um and I did have a train of thought and I've lost it because I was thinking about the internet connection. Oh no. Um, I have okay. a train of thought to jump on if. Uh, if Lovely, I thank you. Yes, um, okay. it, I mean, you know, based on what Monique has just said, you know, you know, people of color, branded terrorists, white people, oh, it's mental health and neurodivergency. Um, it seems to me that in a, in a white dominated culture, um, it's almost like a form of cognitive dissonance. They can't reconcile this idea of what white people are supposed to be you know these grand superior people um and uh, so when a white person does something bad we have to find a reason for why that happened because we have to prove that they're not a normal white person because normally white people are great do you know there was a there's that's really triggered something for me actually because i was um obviously doing some research background research to what we were going to be talking about today and i was looking at dylan ruth who was a shooter in the united states and he was a neo-nazi a fascist self-declared all those things and um and what david said there has really struck home because i've got a quote from dylan ruth because in court they tried to prove that he was autistic and also they tried to prove that being autistic was the reason that he did what he did, that he'd gone out and shot an awful lot of people. 
and they actually got in uh, a quite well-renowned and famous autistic advocate to come in and interview him, assess him, and spoke at court about him. Um, someone we all know who used to be involved in Autism Speaks and is involved in the world of academia quite strongly as well. Um, but the quote from Dylan Roof was this. It's quite chilling, but it's also really on point to what we're talking about today. He said, if they say I have autism, it's like they are trying to discredit me. It discredits the reason why I did the crime. So Dylan Roof did not want to be diagnosed as autistic because he did not want it to become an excuse for the awful things that he did, which is exactly what we're talking about today. And obviously that's coming from the point of view of a murderer, um, which we don't want to justify his comments. But there's truth to what he's saying there in terms of that's not an excuse for me. That's not the reason that I did this. I did this because of my ideology. And that's really not what's being reported in many of these shootings, that it automatically goes out to, you know, this person is black, so therefore they're a terrorist, or this person's a person of color, so they're a terrorist. And that's the reason, because they're black, because they're a person of color, or they're white, so we have to other them because that takes away our kind of supremacist views of ourself, and we have to blame something else, which is neurodivergence or mental health, or we have to other them because then they're not part of our group. We have to stigmatize them. And there's a really easy target to stigmatize them with. We'll just paint them with an autism label. And at no point in any diagnostic manual or you know assessment does it state to be autistic, you must be violent or you must commit violent acts and crime and so on. Um, so again, that's just stereotypes as well that are being attached um, by people who don't really understand and don't know any better. Does anyone have any other comment on what we've discussed? Um, otherwise, I do have another question. I mean, I feel like before we move on from this section, it's just worth mentioning the hypocrisy here because, you know, so often when autistic people talk about their accommodation needs and what they struggle with is, oh, don't use your autism as an excuse. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, someone goes and kills a bunch of people it's like, oh he was autistic well that explains it you know as if that is an excuse literally what what kieran just said as if it's an excuse um when it's not an excuse you know and i i feel like there's a level of hypocrisy there um or you know or self-contradiction um in 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 what's being said when you know when being autistic or neurodivergent can be used as an excuse for killing people but not for why you struggle to make it to appointments on time. That actually came up in the conference I went to the other week on neurodiversity and the criminal justice system. So one of the speakers said, specifically in regards to autism, they were like, well, ADHD can be used as a, as a mitigating factor for why people might have been involved in certain crimes. So surely autism should be the same. And I was like, I think you're looking at this from the wrong point of view because that's incredibly ableist <laughs> to suggest that that should be an excuse for someone. It's not an excuse. Um, it might give you more insight into someone's kind of way of being or you know the kind of experiences someone's had that might have led them to be more socially isolated or to be marginalized. But it's, it should not be used as an excuse for someone committing crimes and to suggest that it could be does link it to that inherent kind of violent aspect of being neurodivergent. It was like, I think neurodivergent people would argue that none of it should be used as an excuse, not that there should be an equal opportunity to use these things as an excuse. And exactly. And, and if we go back to the 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 dis discussion on the fact that neurodivergent people, people with mental health concerns, etc., are more likely to be victims than perpetrators. You know, the stats do relatively bear out in relation to that. Um, but also the fact that as neurodivergent people, autistic people particularly, we are more likely to die by suicide. Um, you know, we're more likely to harm ourselves than we are to harm other people, um, I think is also worth, you know, mentioning. Um, yes, harm does happen, but usually to ourselves, um, not necessarily towards other people. Any comment on that? I think in relation to that, it's worth remembering just how prevalent the majority of autistic people will face at least one type of victimization in their lifetime. And the thing is, it's usually poly victimization. So they experience multiple types of victimization across the lifespan from childhood 
up into adulthood. Um, and although we don't have really solid figures, um, the numbers that are out there do tend to side with the fact that autistic people are more likely to be victims than perpetrators. Um, and that perpetration of victimization tends to be equal in that there are other things that are going to predict perpetration a lot more accurately um, than being autistic, whereas being autistic does tend to predict that you have been um, a, victim, a victim of some sort of victimization, whether that is bullying, physical assault, intimate partner abuse. Um, yeah, and like you say, we are more likely to hurt ourselves than other people, and we tend to die um, because of unequal access to healthcare or suicide. Um, so when we're hurting, like you say, we tend to be hurting ourselves. Um, and yet we've painted this picture um, and it's it's life limiting. When I was interviewing people for my PhD, they talked about these stereotypes of like white male um, autism and it is almost like this vague, just lump. Um, and every time someone would do something horrific, whether that was, you know, a mass shooting, anything like that, they'd say things like, well, you know, probably should not tell people I'm autistic um, because they're like, I, I don't want to be blamed for this other person's horrific acts. And actually it's like painting a massive cross on my back um, because people won't want their children to be around me. They won't want to be around me because they'll be like, well, what's stopping you from doing that? Um, when in actuality, the chances of, them doing that is so slim and that's really heartbreaking to hear as well because you know nearly everybody in my life that I have a conversation with or support or deal with or have meetings with are autistic and they are my favorite people um you know the kindness and things not all you know we can be you know bog standard autistic people as well that you don't necessarily get on with but it is a problem when Yes, it's a very, very narrow stereotype. Um, so what is, I, I guess we've kind of already touched on this, So, but why is focusing on someone's neurodivergence, such as being autistic, so their identity as an autistic person, why is this making that false equivalency? Um, so I've just got a note that I made for myself. So those of us who are autistic here in this discussion, we seem to have been drawn specifically to roles that help other people in some capacity, whether that's doing research that's about trying to help autistic people or otherwise neurodivergent people, um, maybe training and educating to try and improve people's understandings and be kinder to autistic people, um, or working directly with autistic people to support them. So that's my note. So why are we focusing then, or why, sorry, is focusing on someone's neurodivergency making that false equivalency, given that a lot of us do want to do or go into roles that try to help people? Well, I mean, personally, you know, I, I, I do what I do because I remember how alone I felt growing up. I remember how alone I felt in my 20s. And I wanted to I want to be the person that I needed 10 years ago. And I I, I think that's intrinsically linked to being autistic because I, 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 contrary to popular belief, I, you know, I am hyper empathetic, you know, and I, I, I do believe that that is an autistic trait. I, I've met so many autistic people who experience empathy on such a level that it's almost crippling to them at times. Um, you know, it it's a false equivalency to say that you know to 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 associate us with violent crime as if we're the main perpetrators because it i'm trying to think of how to word this um yeah 
yeah, someone's going to have to come back to me when I when I've thought of how to word this. Sorry. No, that's fine. Thank you, David. Kieran, Can did I you have a point? In? Yeah, I was just going to jump in there, Chloe. Actually, and I think <clears throat> in the converse, context of the conversation that we're having, this is probably going to sound quite out there, but I think for me personally, anger plays a huge part in this, and anger is something that drives me all the time. I am furious all the time because I look around and I see injustice everywhere and i'm not just talking you know obviously particular injustice put upon autistic people and wider neurodivergent people but injustice everywhere and it makes me furious i am raging all of the time but i've taught myself to channel that in order to be able to go out and educate and support people and help people and you know i've been my my background is in education in in primary education so working with young children and and that's really where the anger started for me, where it became not about me anymore, but about the injustices meted out on autistic children that I was supporting and had my hands tied behind my back in terms of what I could do to help them and seeing all the things that were being inflicted on them all the time. And then that goes wider and wider and wider and wider. But from an outside perspective, people could misinterpret me when I say that I am angry and could see that as a something which fuels violence as we've seen you know and the, the way that this has been reported but what also fuels that is that we have these narratives around with we're here talking about autistic people who are overly empathetic who are looking to support other people care about other people genuinely can become overwhelmed by that but yet we also have these narratives around us around challenging behavior we have a network here in the uk for parents who feel that their children are violent and their autistic children are violent, you know? So we have these narratives around us which are fueled by observationists and behavioralists and this kind of mentality which actually does stigmatize us as, and causes these behaviors, but never is self-reflective enough to recognize that they're the problem. And, um, you know, so 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 I think for me, there's two things going on here. And, and this is why there's this, this, um, there's this false equivalence really of we have us talking about autistic people who, are empathetic not that many people actually understand what empathy really means um who do care who have an ability to worry and want to care about other people and help them but yet we also have this other more important more powerful narrative which is completely washing that out which comes from other people who are not autistic can i yes. just sorry i can that see people I to say. oh okay i can see i think monique also but i just wanted because there's two points i think something from david and something from Kieran, well from both of you actually um so what kieran obviously you saying about that very problematic narrative that autistic people particularly autistic children have this experience or this thing called challenging and violent behavior in quotation marks is an incredibly problematic narrative and i just want to give an anecdote and yes it is an anecdote but sometimes if you have enough of them they can be science and evidence but it was this fantastic mum that i met in training once and she said um, that she really found that problematic that narrative because her son who was over six foot um, over 20 stone and was only 15, had broken her arm in a meltdown, but was never violent because she just got too close when he was in distress and he accidentally broke her arm. And she said, I have been in abusive relationships. I have been in violent relationships. My relationship with my son, he is not violent. And so she was a beautiful human being who had recognised the difference between an accidental, you know, outcome from distress versus um, a violent nature. Um, and she said, as soon as she got her son into a perfectly, you know, very good environment, got him into out of school into a better environment, and he, he wasn't able to communicate particularly well, so she couldn't really explain things um, to him. Um, you know, those distress responses really reduced. So I think that was really important. Um, and something I want to pick up on as well is that it's really important to note that, yes, a large number, I would say, of autistic people can be um, hyper empathetic, which a lot of us, I would say, here are. Um, but there are a number of us that also experience extreme alexithymia, for instance. So we really struggle to recognise or understand emotions and things like that. And that's where I feel that the 
the problem is coming because people are misunderstanding what that means. They think because somebody struggles to understand their emotions, struggles to explain them, coming across as unempathetic means that they don't have emotions, they don't care about people. And that couldn't be further from the truth. The number of fantastic people I support who really do struggle with elixithymia, um, they are very lovely, kind people. So there's a big difference between having no emotions and struggling to understand your emotions. So I just wanted to flag that because not all of us are, we're very varied as a community. We're not all also hyper empathetic. Um, so I just wanted to flag that. Monique, I did cut you off, I think, because you would wanted to make a oh, comment. That's okay. What I was going to say is, but it's also, we, we point to these things because it's easier to talk about than talking about things like, you know, the incel culture that's happening. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, that's the idea of involuntary celibacy. Um, and it's a very violent form of misogyny. Um, and I think it's easier to point to neurodivergency and say, oh, maybe this person was an ADHD, -er. maybe they were autistic, maybe they were this and that, because it avoids talking about a very real problem in our society, um, which is a very deeply rooted misogyny. And it's the same way that, especially, I don't know, the UK, um, despite being such a purveyor of things like colonialism and racism, doesn't like to talk about racism. You know, we had a report come out that was like, you know, the UK is not sy systematically racist. And it was a part of my language, but a pile of crap. Um, and it's a way out of talking about the things that we let fester in society and the fact that we won't recognize um, the most extreme ideologies that you get in um, our society as an as an issue. Um, we would have, I think, a lot more use out of talking about things like um, the kind of hate that we let fester and how that intersects. Um, rather than talking about autism and you know attention differences because that's not going to explain like <laughs> the majority um of this it's a very violent ideology that certain people become involved in um yeah and i think we tend to skirt around that because we're like well where do these conversations go we, we we will have to face up to some really hard truths, which is that a very kind of benevolent, benevolent um, misogyny leads to a very malevolent misogyny, which is so de destructive. Um, but we don't really like to address that um, because then we'll have to admit that we have a problem. Um, and we like to think of sexism, misogyny, transphobia, homophobia as things that are in the past rather than very much in the present. And I feel like you've now touched on, and we can have the discussion then around sort of my final question or my final comment, which is what do we want the media to focus on in instances like this, where there is, you know, a, a violent crime committed and the person happens to be neurodivergent, for instance. So what do we want the media to focus on? Or how do we want them to report incidences and change that narrative? So obviously, I think what Monique's saying is really, really key as well. Focus on the things where it, there is known violence, for instance, or known at least incredibly problematic ideologies, um, like within the incel sort of community, if we want to call it that. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, so the question is, what what do we want the media to focus on when they're reporting? Um, Tigo, did you have any thoughts well, on I was, I was, There's a bit from the, 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 the previous question, which I was done again to, and I should have raised my hand really, but part of me thinks also you've got, it's, it's, there's the easy target. And it's that aspect of, you know, the knowledge of what it means to be uh, neurodiverse and you've got um, issues around, you know, all the labels that the public understand and you label for the public still in relative terms is 
is autism and being autistic. And and for someone who's, you know, the oldest person here, has lived through several decades and been involved. I mean, I was brought up in Wolverhampton, and so I was very much involved in issues that were were in that kind of part of the country at the time, race riots, that kind of stuff. And then and then seeing it's that it's almost like the new person to point at. And you know the new kind of so, so it's a, it's an easier um, I can't think of the term here, but it's easier for the general public to understand a finger pointing at an autistic individual than it is to go deeper. Does that make sense? Because we're afraid of going deeper, we don't want to know the reality of what's going out there. So in a sense, it almost feels like there's this kind of hidden campaign to don't no don't let the public know what's going on. Just point the finger at them. Point the finger at them. That'd be brilliant. And I think sometimes there's an aspect of that as well. And with the media. I can't help but think, you know, we're, in this aspect, we're thinking of the media as the, the um, you know, broadcasters, broadsheets, papers, news apps, and so on. I do think you've got a little bit as the media aspect for films and television as well that continue reinforcing. And, I, and I, you know, um, I don't know if any of you have seen The Accountant. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, that's being talked about a lot at the moment from, from what I'm reading that because it's relevant. And what you've got, again, is a media reinforcer of the fact that he's autistic. He's really good at martial arts. He can't get on with people. He has I issues with social interaction and he's really good with a gun and he kills people. And it's like there's as that aspect that reinforces again that the, the press seem to jump onto too, thinking it's it's a truth. It's a fact. Come on, Kieran. Oh, no, no, uh, sorry. Can we go to finish? <laughs> sorry, can we go to Amy first and then go to Kieran? Sorry. Oh, yeah. So I, I think a lot of this comes down to exceptionalism and the kind of the broader narrative around how autistic people are represented and dehumanized. If the inference of someone being autistic and violent then didn't have a knock-on expectation and reinforcement of stereotype, then it wouldn't be a problem to talk about. So some autistic people are bad people because they're human, just like some neurotypical people are bad people, they're also human. But we focus on the autistic part because it is the part we can other. And it's that when we say someone neurotypical is bad, we don't then go, all neurotypical people are terrible. Here are the reasons why it reinforces our bad views about them and we should continue to dehumanize them. But it does for autistic people. And I think until that changes, there's no way to talk about it in the media and that broader public sphere without it then having a negative impact on everybody else. Thank you. And Kieran? Um, to pick up on both those points, actually, because Amy's was really relevant to what I wanted to say anyway, um, there's a wider issue than that kind of one that, that, that reinforces that cultural negative kind of narrative that we have around us. And... And it's not just media in terms of the the press and the film industry and TV industry and stuff, because social media plays a massive part here as well. In 2016, and this is probably a little bit outdated now, I would imagine the figures are worse. Um, Forbes did some research into how often articles are shared without being read. And 59% of articles on social media are shared by people who do not read them, do not even open them, don't even click them. So that's two thirds nearly of all news articles are shared on social media without actually anybody reading them. So this is then driven this social media is problematic anyway, obviously, but it's driven the media, the news media to make things smaller, less amounts of information in their articles and to make headlines more sensationalist. So with David and I have been seeing this, looking at the different headlines around around the shooting recently in terms of kind of the things that they're picking out, autistic, fat isolated mental health you start putting those words in big bold letters people will start sharing them because their confirmation bias is that yes of course people like this do these things because they're the problem and that's the stigma that's been generated the stigma is embedded in our cultural narrative the ableism um, the issues around how we think about people who have mental health conditions and even the fact that the word mental health conditions exists and how that's understood and this is such a huge human-wide societal problem that I don't think we can reliably expect the media to start reporting things differently when there's all this weight of background pressure forcing them down this blind alley. And all of this needs to comes back to changing on an academic level. It needs to change on a cultural level and how that's reinforced in education and not just about ableism and, and 
being neurodivergent. This is about racism, transphobia, phobia, homophobia, sexism, misogynism, all of these kind of narratives. This needs to start from day one in terms of education and how children are taught in school and the things that they're taught about, how parents talk to their children, how we're encouraged to talk to our children and all these social norms which prop up all this awfulness all needs to be torn down and started again. And it, it, it's just, it, it frustrates me because the problem is so enormous and it's a human problem. It's not just a problem within one aspect of humanity. Thank you, Kieran. I can see David as well wants to comment on what I think you've said as well. Yeah, I mean, what what I wanted to, to say is that, especially with, because as Kieran just mentioned, we, we've been looking at some of the headlines from the recent events and uh, the way the media portrays it, it's um, there is this idea in society, I think, that autistic males are predators of some sort. Like I've, I see it get perpetuated all the time. Yeah. And I'm looking at one headline about what happened in Plymouth recently, and it, it literally says, "Obsessed by porn and guns at age 11," say school pals. Like you, you know, you can see what they're trying to do there, and. I guess what I would rather is rather than them focusing on this stuff, why don't we focus on the fact that social media platforms are allowing people to become radicalized to the point that they will go and take other people's lives? You know, why aren't they looking at the systemic failures? I know some of some news articles with recent events have, you know, talked about some of the systemic failures, but whenever these things happen, it, it's usually a, a domino effect of systemic failures and people being radicalized online. But that's never that, especially when it comes to to white people committing these crimes, it, it's not really discussed. It's oh, you know, mental health, autism. Oh, you know, well, they they were a proper weirdo, or you know, whatever you want to say. You know, it it's it makes it dangerous to be autistic, and I think it's really, really inappropriate and irresponsible of the media to report like this but as as kieran said you know they've they've got to go for the sensationalist headlines because that increases the likelihood that people will share their article um and i th i think this is the problem isn't it is they're more concerned with the traffic on their websites than they are with what they're actually saying in their articles and i want to go to monique i just wanted to make a quick comment which is something we talked about just before we started recording and um, that I explained that, you know, there have been guidelines, whether they're um, followed or not, for, for instance, journalists, when they're reporting on any anything in relation to somebody who experiences mental health concerns, there are guidelines to try and reduce the stigma. I don't feel they've got the memo that that should also uh, apply to people who are neurodivergent. So I feel, yes, like you say, the sensationalizing of these um, violent crimes and so on, um, focusing on the neurodivergence of the person, yeah, they're not really paying attention to the guidelines in relation to, to stigma. And, and I think what was really important is, you know, they're reporting on somebody, oh, you should be scared and fearful of, i.e., e., you know, um, male autistics, for instance, um, which ironically and sadly means that we are scared for our lives you know, because of the way they're reporting it. I think that was quite an important thing that you've you flagged there, David, that it's making us scared to be us in society. Um, yeah. I actually had a, a, a friend of mine, because again, I'm, I'm just down the road from Plymouth, who we were chatting after recent events, and they've got a, a face mask with autistic and proud on, yeah? And they said, yeah, I'm going to use the old mask today. And I just went, why? And they went, think about it. And I went, you're joking. And he went, no. He said, I'm not, I'm not wearing that, not in the middle of town. And that brought it home to me as well. And I was like, wow, because then you realize the damage of what's happening at the moment in terms of representation and so forth. And this is what I used to say when I was specifically training about mental health stigma and how to reduce it, is that I felt like every time we took a half step forward, one media report on on somebody who experienced voice hearing or somebody who experienced extreme depression etc took us 10 steps back um, and that is just exhausting because we are constantly trying um monique um you you wanted to say something
no, no, Monique's internet so, again. Uh, two seconds. I think we got you back, hopefully. You could try cutting your mic, your camera off and just speaking. That might help your internet. Can you say that again? You could try cutting your camera off. Let's give this a go. Can you hear me? A little bit. So, yeah, try, yeah, try your comment. Ah, I think we might have lost Monique for a second. So, am I back? I think so. Well, what I was going to say is we also need to take some responsibility for this in re essentially comes research and look at what it's been associated with. A lack of empathy extreme male brain, the inability to recognize that other people have thoughts and feelings, all of these minds, we are this dehumanized idea. I can see Amy nodding as well. So, Amy, do you want to help oh. Monique? Oh. Even an... oh. Sorry, oh. Monique, I'm just going to mute you for a second just to see if you can get your internet back. Sorry. That's it. Thank you. Um, Amy, do you want to jump in there because you were nodding? So I think what Monique was trying to explain that is um, that research, for instance, uh, and researchers really need to take responsibility for some of this issue because of the dehumanization and the theories that we had uh, arguably we lacked a theory of mind which you can discuss in terms of how that's been debunked um that we lacked empathy and so on so do you want to help monique with the yeah so i, I think monique's saying that it, as as academics we we have a responsibility to stop propagating these myths and saying all of these really dehumanizing things about autistic people every time we suggest that autistic people lack empathy you know that there is research coming out to suggest that as you said earlier that's just it's really it's lacking a nuanced discussion around the ways in which a we define empathy because no one can bloody say what it really is um and also the way in which we conceptualize what that means so how we think about other people's feelings or experience emotions ourselves yes that might differ that doesn't mean that we don't understand or care about other people that we have extreme male brains and that that somehow has implications about how we think and how we interact and again understand others um or that we don't understand other minds which research has debunked so again lots of recent research using really robust methods um has shown that autistic people can understand the thoughts and beliefs of other people um and that it's a lot more complicated than just assuming that autistic people are socially impaired. Um, so Damien Milton's work around the double empathy problem and, and studies based on that have shown that autistic people might have different social styles or different ways of communicating, um, but that goes both ways. So neurotypical people are less likely to understand us as much as we're not likely to understand them. Um, and that the burden is always placed on us to understand rather than placed on other people. But every time researchers talk about autistic people as lacking empathy, as not having these skills, it just continues to feed into these wider narratives. And it does have an impact outside of academia because it's picked up by the media, by news channels, by people looking for information when their children get a diagnosis. And, and this is what you're presented with. And I quite like David's comment. Um, I think, Kieran, you wanted to jump in there, I can tell, can't I? Um, that um, David made a comment, um, which is that we need more autistics in academia, but to do that, we need to tackle the ableism in academic institutions. And this has always been something, when I describe 
for say the lay audience what exactly is stigma what is the process of stigma because there's two cognitive components and there's a behavioral component etc cetera, etc cetera. and i always say because there are um you know there's public stigma there's systemic stigma there's internalized self stigma etc and i say the real thing that I'm always actually aiming for is to reduce the self stigma, but it's a chicken and egg scenario. What do you tackle first? Because if you tackle the public and systemic, you're less likely then to internalize negative attitudes, etc. So um, David's point to um, tackle the ableism in academic institutions. Again, it's this chicken and egg scenario. Where do we start? Um, which I feel like that's what a lot of us are doing as autistic people. We're actually putting ourselves in exhausting positions to try and do this because at this point in time yes we do have fantastic non-autistic allies but they're not enough at this point I think is fair to say um to to get us to that point of really breaking down the issues that mean that lots of us can't make it in academia for instance uh Kieran did you want to say something yeah just to kind of I mean to broaden on your point there that we do need more autistics in academia absolutely but in a way that's not enough because of what you said, because of the, the wider ableism kind of narratives and the internalized ableism. And we need more autistics in academia who understand the narratives that are going on around us. And that's the big hump that we have to get over because there are plenty of autistics in academia, some of whom do get it, some of whom don't get it and wildly don't get it as well. And I think that's, that's two aspects of the problem that need to be kind of worked on. How do we get more understanding amongst autistic people about these narratives that are around us some understanding on a superficial level but need to dig really really deep to understand the interconnectivity of it all and i think and one thing that i did want to add here is that i wanted to recognize the privilege that we all have of being able to come on this platform and talk yeah. about this because this is something that separately obviously to the main issue which is awful and an absolute tragedy this is something that has impacted us in a slightly different way and um, because we're autistic and we recognize the harm that the narratives around this are causing on autistic people um but we're all white and there are autistics of color who are dealing with this all the time who don't have the platform that we do to be able to come on here when they feel upset by things that are happening yeah. and rightly upset to be able to come in and have these discussions and have lots of people listen to them. So I think we have to recognize our privilege in being able to do this. And I think maybe this needs to be the start of the conversation mm -hmm. rather than maybe a one-off thing. And I very, very much, you know, if anybody's watching and feels that they have something to say um, on any topic, actually, it doesn't have to be this very somber topic, but on any topic, and they are a black person, a person of colour, you know, I, we will give up our mic for those individuals. I'm just very conscious that some people still don't feel safe, yeah. um, but I want to, and, and I know a number, all of us here, want to be able to give the mic over to those individuals as well. Um, so we will do that. You tell us how we help and we will do it. Um, I think it's fair to say of all of us. Um, I just, because we're co coming back to then, I guess, what we want the media to, to do and not do. So we've talked about the systemic issues and things like that. Um, and I just made a, a note for myself, which is largely to stop focusing on the individual and actually talk about disorder in society because that is largely the problem like you like number of people have said misogyny the issue of incels um the fact that they can even come together and and be really very damaging and destructive um you know why is that what is going on in society this is our society that is disordered it's not necessarily individuals um and why are we just focusing on because then that i think somebody said that and i, I apologize i can't remember who it was but focusing on the individual is easier it's it's cheaper it's less resources etc than tackling why the real reasons why that person got to the point where they were able to perpetrate um violent crime you know the things that were going on around them um are much harder more expensive and more resource um heavy um to to be able to actually make a dent I think is probably also why we focus on the individual. Um, any thoughts? 
See, Monique said that to talk about the violent ideology behind people, uh, the crimes are ideological. Yes, yeah, so stop focusing on the individual. We need to be talking about the bigger picture, what is going on in our society that's allowing or creating these in, uh, circumstances for people to perpetrate this kind of violence. I think this is... Um... This is happening in every aspect of our society. Every every issue, every if you opened up a newspaper or looked in looked on a newspaper app or whatever, and you looked at the kind of different subjects that they're talking about. I mean, environmentalism, all of those, all of the different things. Everything has become so polarized and so extreme. Um, not just in the reporting, but in it's reflected in people's understanding of issues and things. And there appears to be very little nuance anymore, and very little kind of wanting to deep, dig deep and actually put yourself out there to kind of understand the things that are propping up all of these different narratives. And I think that's that, that goes back to the point I made earlier around kind of education and things. But I think we're at a point, I think we're on right on a cliff edge at the moment of just burning up in every way, shape and form that we possibly can. And I, I'm, you know, I think, I think it's fair. I don't know if Tigger's got children, but I think I'd like, I've, I've got three children and I don't think anybody else has. David might have children. But I worry about not just my autistic children, but my children existing 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years down the line, where we're going to be and the society and the world that they're going to be living in. And it terrifies me looking forward. And that's not a reflection on them. I know that they'll, they'll, they'll be as well-rounded as they can be because, you know, I try my best to be able to make that happen, but I can't control the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is not a very nice place to be right now. And it's getting worse, not better. Something that really concerns me sort of related to that is um, I think about, you know, we've got the young children of today who aren't on social media at the moment, but you look at the state of social media at the moment mm -hmm. and it, it feeds into this polarization of the topics. You know, pe people have these closed groups where they share misinformation with each other effectively and they potentiate the effect of that misinformation by effectively encouraging each other within these echo chambers they've created. And it means that you've got websites, you know, for example, Reddit, I think we all know what Reddit can be like. Um, you know, it's got some really dark places mm. on on uh, in Reddit threads, you know, and it worries me, you know, that the kids growing up today, you know, once they're old enough, they're going to be jumping on Reddit and they're, they're just going to be surrounded by these horrific ideologies that are being allowed to grow on these websites. Um, and... You know, I think that's where a lot of the focus needs to be is actually we need to hold people accountable for what what they are letting to grow on their platforms. Um, you know, like like you said, it's not focusing on the individual. Focus on where the ideology is being grown, where 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 it's being allowed to manifest. And why? Why is it? What is why is our society so broken that it is that those are the um, things that some small numbers of people, we need to be clear, it's small numbers of people, are drawn to those types of ideologies. What does that say about society that that is for them, um, becomes important to, to them? Um, you know, very much, yeah, going back to this idea that the society is very disordered at the moment. Um, we're coming up to an hour. So I don't know if anyone's got any final comments, I guess, which is... Potentially, I, um, what, yeah, what narrative do we really want the media to be focusing on, which I know we've kind of just gone through, but I don't know if there's any final comments that people would have. Or if that's a good place to stop. I mean, I guess I, I feel like we should end on some note of hope for autistic and neurodivergent people, um, because it's been quite a bleak conversation. And... Uh, it's true what we've said, you know, it, especially with events that have happened recently in the UK, it can be a scary time to be an autistic person or an ADHD, -er, you know, it, but at the end of the day, we are a, a big community that supports each other. And we, we won't just sit quietly whilst these things are done to us, you know, whilst we're othered and, and treated as 
dangerous individuals. You know, we will fight for each other, and I think that is something to hold on to. And I think I'm going to come to you, Amy. And I think these, uh, the, the, that you folks, the fact that you are here is testament to that because David said, please, can we do a session on this? It's really important. And everybody asked, i.e. you, um, you were like, okay, let, let's do this and let's set some time and, and actually have this discussion. So it's clearly, I think community is I always say anyway we all know this community for us is incredibly important and um, so that's very a very poignant point to make thank you David um, and Amy I was just going to say I, I think it's really important to acknowledge that like as, as well as having these discussions that because we act as a community it is important that we we scoop each other up so when we are noticing autistic people saying things that are ideologically questionable or incredibly racist that we, you know, it's not just a conversation we're having in public where you know, people should be intervening and telling each other, like, actually, that's not acceptable. And the support we provide for each other is also really instrumental in kind of minimising that damage as well. I, I, I echo the community to me has been desperately important over the past year or so. But also I, I go back a little bit for the positive note to, to what Kieran said about his anger. And I kind of think, yeah, I get that parent as well but also i get that that anger that not again why you know from education to to media based to films whatever to research projects books coming out by various authors and so on and i and i take from this that it's just it just keeps lighting that fire if i can say that it keeps lighting the fire and keeps making me do stuff that maybe i wouldn't have done before it just keeps pushing me to be better to do better and to learn and to listen yeah and it's it's that something i just take from this is you know you you brush yourself off, you stand up, and off you go again. And that's that's something I take from so many situations we're in at the moment. And I think if it were the case that all autistic people are these really horrible, violent, evil people, we would not be doing the work that we do. We do it because we meet so many fantastic autistic people who deserve better, um, and that is why we keep doing it as well. Any other final comments from anybody? I've been having a lot of conversations with um, different parents about kind of clashes between parents and autistic people in terms of kind of, you know, we ask a question and we get all these reactions and they're not very nice reactions and we feel people are attacking us and dogpiling us. And, and I think this probably sounds like a tangent, but it is reflective of what we've been talking about here. I think there is a lack of understanding outside the community and sometimes inside the community as well of how much trauma we're all carrying and how much pain a lot of us are in, in terms of, you know, every time I switch on my phone or my computer, every time I look on social media, there is an autistic child being restrained. There is someone being hurt. There is someone being normalized. There is, you know, there is so much awfulness out there that we are witnessing on a day to day level which we take personally, I take personally, I know all of you take personally, mm -hmm. and we're carrying that all the time. And I think it's there needs to be so much more. Yeah, Amy's, Amy's just made a comment there. Um, the research we're doing at the moment around kind of victimization and marginalization and, and, and mate crime and, and those kind of things about how people are being treated and the pain that those people are carrying. Yet, all of us every day in our various aspects in the way that we do things are out there on the front line witnessing this and still trying to support ourselves each other and other parents as well and educating non-autistic people into our experiences and what's going on with us and yet like you said earlier chloe it takes one headline and all of that just sets us back 10 years 20 years back to the days of the early 2000s and the mid the, the, the early mid 2000s when certain academics were writing books talking about us being serial killers and why we're serial killers based on flawed utterly flawed ideas not even facts ideas that just get picked up and carried and become facts just because lots of people talk about them we're living with that all the time and i think outside of our community and even within our community that needs to be recognized more that sometimes if we're a little bit blunt 
maybe it's not just because we're autistic, but maybe it's because it's the 30th time we've written the same sentence, supporting someone in the same way in the last hour, but nobody else sees that. And there's, there's so much lack of recognition of how hard all of us are working. Even the people that aren't doing this for a living, even the people that just sit in groups supporting parents for free all day long, that's a job and it's yeah. a hard one. Thank you. Any other final comments? Okay, thank you everybody so, so much. So thank you, Tigger, thank you, David, thank you, Monique, Kieran and Amy. Um, we This is a, a an extra session, so um, we will be back to sort of typical sessions. We have the double empathy session, for instance, coming up on uh, Saturday, the 28th um, of August, where I think that will actually potentially support a lot of what we've discussed, which is the um, issue of not understanding autistic people and the way we actually communicate in terms of our empathy um, and things like love language. Our love languages are different. You know, the way we communicate that we care doesn't look the typical way that people would expect. And I think that double empathy problem is actually, um, as, a, as a theory, is going to be our best hope actually improving this situation of how we are perceived. Um, so thank you everybody so, so much. Um, and I will speak to you soon.